Income tax 2023-2024. Business use of your home tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because contrary to popular belief, you need to have a strong imagination for income tax preparation. 2023-2024. Here we are in our first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Form 1040 example problem using Lacert Tax Software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website irs.gov irs.gov starting at the standard starting point adam tax man just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in beverly hills 90210 no dependents to start off with we have the schedule c income let's do a quick recap of the flow through of the schedule c income going to the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement format currently having 120,000 income minus expenses of 20 thousand one hundred thousand in essence net income which rolls into the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income line number three business income there's the one hundred thousand which rolls into the form 1040 line number eight additional income from schedule one there's the one hundred thousand also if we go back to the schedule c the bottom line of that schedule c the 100,000 rolls into the schedule se self-employment tax calculating social security and medicare currently calculated line 12 14 129 which rolls into the schedule two additional taxes part number two other taxes line four self-employment tax there's the 14 129 which rolls into the form 1040 page number two and line 23 other taxes there's the 14 129 also if we go back to that schedule se self-employment tax there's the 14 129 half of that is deductible as an above the line or schedule one deduction which is on the schedule one additional income and adjustments page number two part two adjustments to income line 15 deductible part of self-employment tax there's the 7065 which rolls into the form 1040 there it is on line 10 adjustments to income so we have the 100,000 minus the above the line deduction half of the self-employment 7065 adjusted gross income 92,935. we have the standard deduction 13,850. the qualified business income deduction from form 8995 15,817, giving us a subtotal and the bottom line taxable income 63 268 page two calculating the tax to start off with federal income tax using the ordinary income tax rates progressive tax system 9228 and of course that 
other taxes, self-employment tax, 14,129 gives us the total tax thus far, 23,357. That's our starting point. Let's go back to page number one. We're looking, of course, at that 100,000, which is pulling in from the Schedule C. So here's our income statement on the Schedule C. We're looking at the business use of the home this time, which you can see is down here on line 30. Expenses for business use of your home. Do not report these expenses elsewhere. Attach Form 8829 unless using the simplified method. And then see instructions. This is going to be the simplified method. Now, a couple things just to note. As we do the data input into this form, we get this from the bookkeeping system. So you can imagine someone doing bookkeeping. Maybe they do it in QuickBooks or something. They're providing us with the income statement. The income statement is basically what the Schedule C is, income minus the expenses. No matter how good the bookkeeper, however, they're not going to be able to exactly give us the information if there's a business use of the home because the problem is we cannot easily break out between the personal and business for expenses, especially the indirect expenses related to the home. In other words, we're paying bills on the home that cover the entire home like the utility bill and possibly the rent or the mortgage payments and whatnot where we have interest and so on, real estate ta taxes for the entire home. But part of it is going to be a business uh, expense, possibly. Now, even if the bookkeeper was to try to break out the business portion versus the personal portion, we still want the bookkeeper to do it in such a way that they can give us the total expenses for the home because we're going to have to recalculate it, most likely, figuring out our own percentage. So again, no matter what happens, we're, we're, if they qualify for a home office, we're probably going to have to do like an adjusting entry even if the bookkeeping was done basically perfectly. And therefore, when we communicate with the bookkeeper, we want to try to get them to record the expenses related to a home so that we can recognize them easily. Either they put them on the books as an expense, and then we're going to reduce the expense or do the allocation for the expense in a similar way as we have to do with the automobile, for example, where they're going to put it on the books at what they paid for and we're going to use the mileage method and have to make an adjustment or the actual method and include things to it such as uh, the depreciation uh, calculation generally same thing here we're going to say if they put it on the books as an expense we're going to have to look at those expenses and limit it or maybe they don't put it on the business side because they're basically personal payments for the for the home utility bill and whatnot in which case it won't be on the income statement that they give to us and we're going to have to ask them for the expenses that they paid for the related costs of the home so that we can then do the calculation now the the things that we're typically are going to need is one do they qualify for a business expense usually we're thinking do they have a pr principal office basically in the home where they do the administrative work we talked about this in a prior presentation in the powerpoint side of things so you can look there in more detail uh, but that's the general idea and then the exception to those general rules are do they have a daycare center or is it dealing with inventory or possibly a separate structure to the home in which case the rules can be a little bit different as to whether they qualify or not if they do qualify then we have to say okay how are we going to break out between the business and personal we could use if they're not renting if they if they own the home you might be able to use a simplified method uh, the simplified method could be easier in that you don't have to deal with depreciation and whatnot. But as we talked about in prior presentations, it's likely that the simplified method uh, isn't going to give you as big a deduction if you live in high cost of living areas like cost like California or New York. If you live in low cost of living areas, it might be a beneficial thing to to do. So it kind of depends on where you are located on the simplified method but you can do both calculations and see which one would result in a larger deduction or you can use the actual method where we're gonna have to use some ratio analysis to break out the amount of the indirect expenses between the office and the the non-business part of the home all right so that's going to be the the general process now there's also going to be a substantial difference 
if we're using the actual method, which we'll start off with as if we rent or if we own the home. If we own the home, it gets a lot more complicated because it's likely that we also get a deduction for the Schedule A here with expenses related to the home for taxes, property taxes related to the home and interest. So if someone owns a home, remember that that's usually the big thing that pushes people over from a standard deduction to the itemized deductions. If they have a Schedule A, they probably own a home. If they also have a business, then the business, we might be able to deduct part of the interest for the home used for the business. But they're already getting a deduction for it on the Schedule A. We can't double dip. We can't deduct it twice. But we can allocate. We have to allocate, therefore, between the interest on the Schedule A versus the Schedule C, as well as the property taxes, which adds a level of complexity, as does the depreciation of the actual home itself. Uh, but if we rent, then it's going to be a lot easier because basically we don't have any property tax. We don't actually own the home. We don't deal with depreciation. We don't have any mortgage interest. We could just break out the rent between the business portion and the, the other portion. So let's, let's start off with that situation. So let's imagine that we have our home that we are renting and we're going to say, what's the business use area? So this is going to be our ratio calculation. How do we know the percent of the bills that we're going to apply to the business? Well, we can look at the square footage. Let's say it was 300. Let's say, well, let's say it was 400 for our office. And then the total area of the home, let's say is 1200, 1200. Now, how would I get those numbers? The 1200 you probably will have because if you just look up your home, you know, on Zulu or something like that, then you probably have that on the, on the purchase documents and whatnot. But uh, uh, you probably don't have each room and the area of it, remembering that it doesn't even have to be a full room because you might not need a, a whole wall that separates your business from the personal side uh, of things. So you might have to actually, you know, get the old ruler out and t take a look at the length versus the width of the area, multiply them together. That's going to give you uh, your square feet. All right. So so this this has to do with daycare facilities. So remember, daycare facilities have their own kind of uh, complications because in that case, you use part of the facilities for uh, for business versus personal. Whereas here, we're assuming we use this 400 square feet exclusively for business. So area of home uh, included above used exclusively for daycare, business uh, percent. This is an override within the software. And so then we have any uh, unallowed carryovers. Now, if we had, we'll talk about the disallowance of some of the, uh, the costs if we run into a loss, in which case we might have a carryover type of situation. Now we have this breakout between the indirect expenses and the direct expenses. Now the indirect expenses you would think are going to be those expenses that you're paying the bill for the entire home which you have to allocate using the percent allocation between the business and personal use. The direct expenses are those that you made for the directly to the office. And therefore you would think you'd get basically the full amount of deduction here. So let's say we have then, for example, uh, rent. Let's say the rent is 2,400 for the rent. Repairs and maintenance. Now, if the repairs and maintenance were done on the the office then a hundred percent of it would be down here repairs and maintenance as a direct expense but if we repaired the roof we didn't replace the roof if we re repaired the, if we replaced the roof and we owned the property we might have to put that on the books as an asset but when we rent if they repair if they replace the roof that wouldn't be us doing it as the renter right so we might but we might have some small some other repairs that we do in in the home let's make it an indirect of 300 utilities make that 450 these are utilities like the heat the water and whatnot that we would expense for the entire home we would pay for the entire home trying to allocate a portion here excess mortgage we don't have mortgage if we're renting we'll talk about that shortly state excess mortgage interest real estate taxes once again we don't have basically if we are renting so that's going to be our starting scenario 
And then on the direct expenses, real estate taxes, if it was direct casualty, insurance, miscellaneous rent, repairs and maintenance, maybe we did some repairs to the actual office as opposed to repairs to the home itself. Let's say this was like $100. Utilities, if you can break up the utilities just to the office, but that's difficult to do because usually you pay the gas and electric for the whole home, excess mortgage interest, and so on and so forth. Let's see the calculation. Let's see what happens here. Que paso. Back to the Schedule C, profit or loss from business. At the bottom of the schedule, we have line 30, expenses for business use of your home, calculated at the 1150 bringing down the net income. So it's basically a deduction that is coming from the Form 8829, which is now populated. So let's go to Form 8829, expenses for business use of your home, part number one, part of your home used for business. So number one, area used regularly and exclusively for business, regular daycare or storage and so on. That's the 400 that we put in place. Total area of the home, 1,200. So if we divide that out, 400 divided by 1,200, we're getting that 0.33 or 33.33%. 33 then we have this information on line four, multiplied days used for daycare. We're not dealing with daycare here, so we don't have to deal with that. Uh, if you started or stopped using your home for daycare during the year, so again, we're not doing the daycare thing. So the business percent, 33.33%. Then part number two, figure your allowable deduction, line eight. Enter the amount from Schedule C, line 29, plus any gain derived from the business use of your home, minus any loss from the trader business. Basically, starting at the adjusted gross income that we're pulling in before this basic deduction that we have. So, in other words, we have the 1040, we have the adjusted gross income that has been adjusted down due to the business use of the home. But if we remove that business use of the home, we in essence get what we would have on Schedule C, the subtotal right here before we deducted this. And that's in essence what's pulling into our form expenses for business use of your home. Why do we need that? Because it's going to be acting in essence as a ceiling because if we have a deduction that's greater than that, then these expenses are going to be bringing us into negative territory possibly, which the IRS will be suspect of. Because if we have negative amounts, we might be able to take that against other income, such as W-2 income. So we don't have to worry about that here because we have 100000 in place. So any deduction we can get should be good. So then we have the, uh, the items up top. See instructions for column A and B. Casualty losses, deductible mortgage interest on the direct side for A and indirect for B. So the general idea for direct versus indirect is that if it's a direct expense, it was something that you expended for the office. So if you had repairs directly for the office, then you would think you would get full amount of that not having to multiply it times the 33.33%. But if it's indirect, like paying the utilities for the full business, you would think then you would have to multiply by the 33.33, allocating the business portion to it. So then down here, we've we've got the items, mortgage interest, uh, real estate taxes, insurance, and rent. And then we're looking at the, uh, well, we have the rent here. Now the rent is indirect because we're paying for the entire home, allocating the portion to the home office. The repairs, we had $100 that we said was direct. Therefore, we should get 100% of this 100. 300 was repairs on the home in general, which would have to be subject to the 33.33 allocation. You've got the utilities at the 450, which is indirect. So if we add up uh, the, the two subtotals, we got the 3,000. Uh, 150. So multiply line 23 by line 7. In other words, we're taking the indirect amounts here of the 1050 times the 0.3333. And that's going to give us then, hold on, something didn't go right there. Let's do that again. 3150 times 0.3333 is going to give us the about 1050 rounded for the pennies. And so then we have line 26, adding line 23, line 24, and 25. So now we have the 100 plus 
that uh, 1,050 gives us the 1,150. Line 28 is the limit on excess casualty losses and depreciation. So th we're not gonna be limited because we have sufficient income. And then we have then line 29, excess casualty losses. Uh, we don't have to deal with that here. No depreciation of your home from line 42 below. Carry over from prior years. If we were disallowed in prior years, adding uh, those up for line 32, allowable excess casualty losses. And then we're finally going to be adding these up. That gives us the 1,150 casualty loss portion, if any, from line 14. We're not dealing with the casualty losses. Allowable expenses for business use of the home than the 1,150. Now, part three deals with depreciation on the home, which we don't have to deal with in this case because we're dealing with a rental situation. And so we might look at a depreciation situation shortly. And then we have the carryover of unallowed expenses, which again, we don't have to deal with because we had income uh, to cover the expenses. That's why this pulls over then to the schedule C and we see it then pulling in here, reducing our uh, income. So that looks good. Let's imagine then that we have a situation where we didn't have enough income to, to cover the, the deduction. So let's say that our, our income, let's go back to our Schedule C duh, 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 and say, duh, duh, and we're going to say that this was our expenses were at before the home office was was at the 119,000. So we only had, if I go back then to my worksheet, we only had $1,000 of net income before dealing with the home office. So in that situation, we can go back on over and say, okay, what happened with my calculation? The expenses, the percent is the same, but now we had a limit of $1,000 so when I when I go through this calculation, it's now basically limiting it to a thousand dollars, not letting me go below basically the the thousand because that would bring me into a loss. So instead of getting one thousand one hundred and fifty, it's capping it at one thousand. Do I lose the rest then? The answer: No, we're not going to lose the rest. Hopefully, because it's going to have a carryover. So in the following year we might be able to take the 150 if we have enough income to to be able to take the 150 given similar kind of restrictions that you would expect to be in the following year if the tax code uh, remains constant. Okay, so now let's go back to where we were, but now we're gonna assume that we have purchased the home. So I'll put this back to 20,000 and then I'm gonna go into my calculations here and I'm gonna remove Let's just remove these amounts right now. Well, I'll keep the 100 here. The rent is going to go away because now we're going to assume that we own the home and therefore we're not going to be paying rent, but we'll be dealing with uh, the mortgage interest and property taxes. Now, the thing is, if we own the home, then it's likely that, that then we're going to be itemizing. Taxpayers going to be itemizing in that case because the thing that usually pushes people over to itemize is the ownership of the home resulting in the loan interest possibly being deductible on the Schedule A as well as the, the taxes. That's going to impact our calculation for the business use of the home office as well as, again, that depreciation situation. So let's first add these as though we have the Schedule A on the books first. Now, so if we didn't have, for example, the, the business use of the home, let's think about it that way first. And let's just say that we have an itemized deduction for the interest. And let's say that the interest was at the home business use of the home. Let's say it was 20,000 just to make it well over the standard deduction. And then if I go to the taxes, we have the real estate taxes. Let's say that the that was 6,000. So now if I go back to my forms, now we have the Schedule A being populated. The Schedule A deductions are going to be pulling through to 27,141. In this case, pulling through to the Form 1040. The Form 1040 now having the 99,000 from 
the business minus the above the line deduction 7040 the adjusted gross income 92610 and then instead of taking the standard deduction 13850 we're taking the itemized deductions of the 27141 okay so now we're going to think about breaking out the mortgage interest between and the real estate taxes between the schedule c and the schedule a in a way that we don't double dip and then we'll get into the depreciation calculation uh, after we deal with this piece of it so if i go back on over and say okay let's go back here and do my data input on my business use of the home same percent we're going to say 400 room or office space versus the 1200 house that we now own and now we're going to go down to the uh, real estate taxes and the mortgage interest. So if I put the 20,000 here in the real estate taxes at the 6,000, then when I pull it over, I'm going to go to uh, the forms. Now it's being pulled over and on the form 8829 uh, business use of the home. We see the 20,000, the 6,000. And then it's taking basically 33.33% of that. So that's the 26,000 times the 0.3333. And that's going to be the 8666. Problem here, though, if I go back to the Schedule A, notice what the software did. It boosted it up. I put 20,000 in here. It boosted it up to 33,000 for mortgage interest. So you have to be careful of that, of course. So, so the question is, where do I do the data input so the software can help me do the allocation between the two locations. In this case, I'm going to go back to then the Schedule A and say I'm going to remove it here, get rid of that, and get rid of that, and then go back on over. And now we have the 13, uh, 133, uh, 13334, which makes sense because this is the amount that we deducted from on the other side. So it's on, on, the form 8829, which is going to go to the Schedule C. If I add to that the 13334, that's going to get us to the 21. And then up top, we have the similar kind of thing for the taxes for the real estate taxes, which is right here, which is another 400 plus or 4,000. 4,000 now got allocated here, and that comes out to the uh, 26,000 about which is the total expenses that we should have got because we said that there was 20,000 for the mortgage interest and 6,000 for the real estate. And between the two of these, between this area, the 4,000, the uh, mortgage interest of the 13,334 and what we're deducting over here, which was the 33%, uh, 8,000, 666 of the 20,006 we're, we're mapping it out see so that's kind of the the thing we have to be careful of when we're doing our actual expenses because again we get that deduction elsewhere so you got to think if it's being deducted on both sides now in some cases you might have a situation where the the you're not getting a schedule a deduction even though they own the home possibly because they already paid off the loan or something like that, right? So now they're not over the threshold of the the itemized deductions or the loan interest is fairly small amount. In that case, then you might have those items down here be, so, be, to indicate that it's not being allocated between the Schedule A and uh, the Schedule C. So up here, we're indicating there is an allocation between the Schedule A and the Schedule C. The IRS most likely getting forms related to at least the mortgage interest. And so they can kind of double check that on their side that we have the proper allocation between the, the two uh, locations. From a data input perspective, it can be a little confusing from a reviewer's point of view because when we get like the 1098, we're going to usually be looking on the data input screen for the Schedule A. That's where we would typically go. And in this software, notice we don't input it there because we input it over here instead. And then it's going to help us to do that allocation between the two locations. Okay, so the next thing we might have to deal with is the depreciation of the home. So let's go into the depreciation then. So this is going to be confusing for a few different reasons. If we put in the home on the books because 
we might not have just purchased the home and therefore we might not know exactly what the basis of the home is or the cost of the home because we purchased it or acquired it or got it in some prior period. So then the question is, if I'm putting the home on the books, what's going to be the value of it? In other words, if I purchase like property, plant, and equipment for a business, for business use, then we're going to have depreciation schedules related to it because the tax code is going to force us to put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it. But a home, because it's personal in nature, means that we don't usually track the basis as closely. We have to track the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes because we get a deduction for those, but we don't actually track really the basis of the home because it's on the personal side of things and we're not depreciating it. So if we start a business at a later point, we've got to figure out what that basis is. How do we do that? Well, we can go back to the purchase price if we purchased it and or we, we, if it was inherited or something, that gets a little bit more confusing to think about the basis in an inheritance situation that you can basically uh, dig into. But we can think about the purchase side of things and then compare that to the fair market value uh, at the given point in time. And typically we're taking the lesser of the basis and the fair market value, the basis being the cost of the thing that we purchased plus any improvements we made to it that's going to be our original basis when we start using it as the home office. If we make improvements after the point in time that we start depreciating it as a home office, then we have to add those improvements as a separate line item. So then we have to be thinking, okay, once I figure out what the cost is, I have to be allocating between the, the building, the house and the land, because I don't get to depreciate the land. I only get to depreciate the building. And the question is, well, how can you do that? Sometimes the property tax statements are broken, will break out between the land and the building, and you can use that ratio. So for example, uh, let's say that we, we, we go back and we look and we say we purchased the, the home for you know $500,000. And currently the fair market value of the home, if we compare it to homes that are being sold at this point in time, close to us, is $600,000. So if we take the lesser of the two, you would think we're going to be taking the basis of $500,000. Okay, so that's going to be, but now the $500,000 is for both the home and the land. So if I look at my property tax statement, the property tax statement is based on the value of the home, but it not might not add up to $500,000. The property tax statement might have been appraised at some different time frame. But the property tax statement might add up to like four hundred thousand dollars, and they and they might be able to you might be able to use the ratio calculation where they're saying of the four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand was for the building, uh, and and one hundred thousand was for the land. So three hundred thousand divided by four hundred thousand would be that seventy five percent was for the building, right? And I'm saying the basis for me is five hundred thousand. So I'm going to say that 75% based on the property tax allocated towards the building times what I purchased it for is going to be times the 500,000. So I'm going to put the building on the books at the 375. Was that right? 500,000 times 0.75. So I'm going to say, okay, the house, a house, is that how you spell house? I think so. It's going on the books. We're going to say it's a category. It's going to be a building. And then we're going to say the date that we placed it in service is going to be, I'll say the first year of the tax year that we're looking at here. 010123, the cost 375,000, no 179. The method that we're going to use is non-residential real estate. So it's going to be a long depreciation uh, property. So it's going to be non-residential real estate. You might say, hey, it's residential, it's a home, but you're talking about the business office portion of it. So we're kind of deducting it like a business office. So non-residential real estate. And then, duh, 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 duh. Now you might also put the land on the books just so you can get to the total basis. So you can see what your calculation was. Land is going to be in category here. And that's going to be the this minus the 500 thousand or the 125,000 you can put it on the books 010123 125,000 and you're not going to depreciate it because it's land so it's just going to be on the depreciation schedule to show you 
be, that the two of those add up to the 500,000, which is what you actually paid uh, for it. So that'll help you to see kind of the percentage breakout between the two, but it's not going to impact your calculation for the home office. All right. So then if we look at our depreciation schedules, now we have these on the books. So the house is now on the books and uh, we've got the cost. We've got the uh, business percent, which is the 33.33. Uh, 33. So the depreciation basis, right, is going to be the 124. So of the 375 house part of the home that's used for the home office part, I should say, times the uh, 0.3333, sorry, this is the house part, not versus the land, times the percent for the home office means that we have a deductible potential deduction of 124,988 basis. But I have to deduct that over 39 years using a straight line mid-month convention. So we assume we purchased it in the middle of the month in January in our case. So I'm going to divide this then. Uh, we're going to divide this by the 12... I'm sorry, divided by... <laughs> What did I do? What did I do? 12, 9, 12, 4, 9, 8, 8 divided by 39 is going to be the 3,204 divided by 12 times 11.5 is going to be that uh, 3,076 about, right? And that's what's going to be pulling into the form uh, 8829. So now we've got the same calculation up top for the mortgage interest and the taxes and then the repairs, utilities. And now we've got the depreciation at the 3,076. We have enough capacity to take the depreciation. So the depreciation on your home, enter the smaller of the home's adjusted basis or its fair market value. So that's the 500,000. Oh, hold on a second. 500,000 and then value of land is 125,000 basis of the building, 375,000 uh, bu business basis of the building, uh, 124,000. This is the depreciation percent. So the depreciation 3,076. And that's pulling into this amounts pulling into the schedule C. So now we're at the 12,092 for the home office, bringing the net income to 87908. Uh, now also just realize with the depreciation schedules, once you have the data input, it should be easier for the following year to calculate next year's depreciation in 2024, but you wanna use the same software so that the software can help to basically allocate it to the future point as well. We also have to be careful though, that we're kind of, now we're using part of the home for business versus personal, which raises questions about if you sell the home and you want the exclusion of the home when you sell it as your principal residence raises questions with that and it also cuts into the basis of the home because now you're consuming part of the basis of the home getting a tax benefit for it so when you when you sell the home at some future point the likelihood of having a larger gain uh, will happen as well so because of those consequences I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, you might choose like the simplified method, right? The simplified method would mean that we're not possibly having to cut into the basis of uh, the, the depreciation of the property, not having to break out on the schedule A between the mortgage interest and on the schedule C and the schedule A. So it's just easier that way uh, as well, but likely if you're in a high cost of living area, that it's not going to come out to as big a deduction in the current year. Okay. Now, if you had improvements after that point in time on the home, so if we had improvements, if it was repairs, then we would say if it's re repairs on the office, we can deduct it possibly as a direct expense. If it were repairs on the entire home, we would have to allocate it between the office, uh, business and personal. And if it was like an improvement, like a new roof, then the question is, do I have to fix 
this amount here or adjust it or I put it, the, the answer is no, I put it on the books as another item. So it would be improvement, a new roof or something like that. And then that would be going into improvements on 010123. Let's say it was for 50,000. And then we would we would use the same method as 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 though we purchased the thing in the current year, meaning in this case the 39 the 39 year uh, straight line non residential. So that's kind of how the improvement would go. And then of course, when you go back to your depreciation schedules, you would have the improvements on the books as well as a separate line item and it's doing the calculation on them as well. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the indirect method. So if I was using the indirect method, then I can get rid of all this. I wouldn't need to put this on the books. I'd still, I'm still imagining we owned the home. And so then I can go into the business use of the home. And instead of doing this allocation, this way, I'm not going to do that. We're going to use not the in, the indirect method. I'm going to use the simple method is what we call it. Simple method. So I'm going to keep the total area at 400. So we still have to measure the area of the office, but I don't need the full area because it's basically just going to multiply the amount of the office space times a fixed rate. Now it's gonna cap us, however, at 300. So the reason I put 400 here is to show you that it's gonna cap it at 300. All right, so let's go back on over and say, now I'm on the Schedule C. This is the Schedule C, Profit and Loss. And if I scroll down, now we're using the simplified method, enter this total square footage of the home. I could still enter that, it wants that here. Let's put, what did I say, 1200, and then boom, and then, and then and B the part of the home used for business 300. So and then what is it doing? It's just taking the uh, the business part 300. It capped it. We put 400 square feet times five dollars, just a flat rate. Now again, that five dollars should be taken into consideration all the stuff, meaning the the allocation of the mortgage interest the real estate taxes and the uh, depreciation on the home. However, so you might look at this and say, oh my goodness, the, the, the other method was so much larger, it's ridiculous. But remember that the, the part that's related to the, to the real estate taxes and the mortgage interest of the home was already deductible on the Schedule A. So, you, so when you're trying to compare these two methods, you have to fig, you have to think about that. You say, okay, yeah, I would have been able to deduct the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes here, but I'm not going to get an added tax benefit if I was already getting a full tax benefit on the Schedule A. And so you have to kind of remove that from the calculation and think about this compared to to the utilities and whatnot, as well as possible the depreciation of the home and with regards to the depreciation of the home, remember that that's eating into the basis of the home and possibly complicating the, the calculation when you sell the home where you wanna get that huge exemption. Because when you sell your principal residence, you might get this huge exemption that allows you not to record a gain at the time of sale. But if part of the home is business part of the home, that complicates that. And it also complicates the amount of the gain that could possibly exceed the exemption and whatnot. So all, all, all of that stuff kind of complicates the actual method again, which is why the simplified method could be useful. So you have to take those into considerations when you're doing your comparison. Here's the worksheet, the 300 cap that I put on it, nice and easy calculation. That's the nice thing about the simplified method. Uh, and, and going forward, you don't have the depreciation schedules and that kind of stuff that you have to deal with again I would assume the simplified method is going to be more competitive uh, uh, to, to, the, to the actual method in states that are lower cost of living because they had to use the same method blanket across the entire country and there's wildly different cost of living calculations in terms of home prices and whatnot uh, across the country.